Uh, thanks again, Ryan, and everybody for taking the time to join this webinar. Um, coincidentally, I was looking at uh, 100 years ago from today at 1914. Uh, it marked an event that, you know, the world has changed after. It was the first flight, first scheduled flight uh, from uh, St. Petersburg to Tampa, Florida. It was a 23-minute uh, flight with one, only one, paying passenger at that flight. It was the former uh, mayor of St. Petersburg, uh, Abraham Phil. And that event is extremely important because in 2014, after 100 years, um, this industry remains to be one of those industries that has transformed the world, truly. Uh, connecting businesses, critically important to the world economy, but most importantly, in my view, bringing cultures and people closer from one another. Um, the future of this industry is also promising. The uh, expected growth in terms of passenger and cargo numbers is on the positive side. Uh, demand for the air transport services is expected only to double or triple in the coming decades. Uh, so there is no concern on that area. On the flip side, and just being honest with you, uh, that the industry is in constant challenge to uh, sustain its activities from a pure economical point of view. Just to give you an example, looking at the airline uh, segment, which is one of the critical value chain uh, stakeholders, return on invested capital uh, remained between 3.8% to 4.1% between the 1996 and 2011. So <clears throat> this, this rate, which is 4.1% currently, um, is considered still uh, as below normal for any investor to put their capital in this industry. So it's very, very critical from one hand to the global economy, and no economy can sustain without aviation being part of it. On the flip side, the value chain members are struggling to sustain themselves with uh, viable return on capital invested. And, and, and therefore, there is there's really a need for us here to think a bit differently than traditional. Uh, and hopefully this webinar will not solve all our problems, but will spark ideas and thoughts that we will be able to share with you uh, in this dialogue with our uh, two uh, professors from, from Stanford, Ray and Haim. And it's really my honor to uh, moderate this uh, question and answer with your help. So as Ryan mentioned, please feel free to propose your questions and we'll try to address as much as we can during this uh, webinar. Uh, Professor Haim, I have a question which really will help us start this webinar related to the business models. Uh, I mentioned that this industry as a, as a scheduled flight industry started almost a hundred years from now, in 1914. And that basic business model of scheduled passenger flight remained almost the same with some few changes throughout this century. Uh, we, we hear a lot about this notion of disruptive business models. So I, I'm curious to know, and I'm sure a lot of the audience is, is interested to know your views on what does it exactly mean to have a disruptive business model and how this model can be applied to uh, different industries, but also including our air transport industry. So the uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, so when people think about disruption, we usually have an image of maybe a fire or an earthquake or a bridge collapsing or some disaster happening. Uh, in management, uh, we think about it a little differently, and it's useful to start with a definition of what disruption means and we'll then apply it to historical events uh, in the industry. And later in the webinar, we'll talk about some of the impact of emerging technologies. So starting with uh, what disruption means, uh, we have an incumbent or an established player in the industry, which is successful and profitable, typically high margin. They have a business model that works well. They have customers that love them and they have a decision makers that work well with the customers. And there is a virtuous cycle where customers ask for more, and we give them more, and we do exactly what the customer is looking for. And as a result, we get customers to love us more, 
and, uh, and the industry continues to thrive uh, in this self-reinforcing uh, virtuous cycle. What can disrupt this cycle is the emergence of an innovator. And when the innovator shows up, they're typically sc scrappy. They introduce a low-end, low-performance, low-cost solution that nobody takes seriously, or almost nobody takes seriously. And disruption really means that over time, the innovator keeps improving their solution to the point where they can actually overtake the uh, incumbent, and they become the major player in the industry. It doesn't mean that the incumbent goes away. It simply means that the incumbent loses its dominant position in the industry. And let's see how this process works. And we'll do it first by looking at a simple product to understand the process. And then we'll apply to the history of travel distribution. So think about uh, the 70s and 80s when the personal computer shows up in the computer industry. And at that point in time, a leading product is many computers. And a company that's doing very, very well is digital equipment. So digital equipment was the leading mini computer vendor, very innovative company, uh, very, very successful. They, uh, they sell lots of mini computers, and numbers are increasing. And a mini computer may sell for $100,000. They may have a margin of maybe 60% of that mini computer. And their customers love them and tell them how to improve the product, which they do, and the cycle continues. And then the personal computer shows up on the scene in the late 70s and early 80s. And digital is looking at the personal computer and saying, eh, this, is a, this is a toy. It's not even a computer. And in fact, Ken Olson, who was the chief executive of the company, famously said, I don't understand why anybody would want to have a computer in their home. And he was actually right, because from his perspective, a computer was like a big bulky machine consuming lots of energy and doing lots of calculations. And a, the personal computer was not that. It was a small thing that was incapable of doing almost anything. What has happened over time is that technology has improved for both mini computers and personal computers. And over time, the personal computer arrived at the point where they could actually meet the demands and the needs of mainstream consumers. And what has happened as a result of that is that a lot of the market has shifted uh, to the point where the mini computer market started declining and the personal computer market became a mainstream market. So that's kind of the first part of disruption. But there is always a second element in disruption which we need to keep in mind, and that's the, ele the management element. Uh, Ken Olson was a smart guy, and he realized that all of this was happening. So he went to digital equipment and said, we need to be in the personal computer market. And digital was in the personal computer market. In fact, I had a, a digital personal computer at the time. So I know for a fact that they were. But that computer was not very successful. It was not very successful, not because it was technically uh, inferior. It was because the entire culture and business model and the way digital operated was designed to work with large machines, expensive machines, high margin. They went to market with an expensive sales force that talked to customers. And their business model was not designed to sell a low-end product. So what happened is that in spite of the fact that they could see that the personal computer was taking their industry away, they couldn't do very much about it because they didn't have the ability to transform themselves to the point where they could be an effective maker of personal computers. So disruption, in summary, has two elements. One is a low-end solution which progresses with technology to the point of becoming a mainstream solution. And second, management rigidity that makes it difficult for the incumbent to change their structure, to change their organization, to change their business model 
to the point where they can adapt. An interesting example, of course, in the aviation industry is the evolution of a travel distribution. And let's think back to the history of the industry. Historically, a, the vast majority of airline tickets were actually sold direct by the airlines before the regulation. And the reason was that there was just one price. The price was regulated. So people found it convenient and easy to call their favorite airline and uh, to use that airline to go wherever they needed to go. What has happened in the 70s and then in the 80s was, first of all, deregulation that made price competition an important element of what happened in the industry. And second, yield management that resulted in many different prices available for any given flight and dramatically increased the complexity of travel distribution. The combination of these two factors made travel agents much more important players in the industry because they could reduce the complexity of res reserving, selecting, and booking a flight from a consumer's point of view, and they could reduce the amount of work and complexity needed from the airline's point of view because in a competitive market, the ratio of actually searches to actual bookings has dramatically increased. So the travel agents could create significant value for both the airlines and the passengers, and as a result, became the major way in which airline tickets were sold to the point where they had about 80% of the leisure market. By 1994, there were about 45,000 travel agency offices in the United States, and at the same time, the average tra travel agent commission has increased to 12%. Of course, 1994 is an interesting year because that's a year where the, where the Internet became increasingly mainstream. And in the mid-90s and then in the later 90s, we had an increase in, uh, in the introduction of online travel agencies that enabled passengers to book travel electronically online. And the airlines themselves uh, shifted their own distribution to electronic distribution over the internet because what happened now is that their cost of contacting individual customers dramatically declined as a result of the introduction of new technologies. The result of that is that at the time, actually, a booking through a travel agent was a very complex and a process and a pretty bad user experience. But yet that user experience has improved over, over time to the point where electronic bookings became the mainstream way in which uh, initially airline travel and other types of travel have been booked. And of course, that was not uh, helpful to travel agents, where today we have less than 15,000 travel agency offices in the United States. The commissions on domestic flights are going down to almost zero and uh, the industry has been transformed. It's interesting to note the travel agents are not going away. Essentially, they have changed their business models for one where they've been primarily order takers to one where they have to add signif significant value. And indeed, if we focus on the leisure market, when you talk about complex travel, tour, cruise, group travel, when you talk about specialized solutions, think about going on a honeymoon, you may want to actually go to a travel agent that will configure an effective solution for you. So what has happened is that they've transformed the, their business models to one where they could actually add significant value for customers, which is the nature of what happens in many different industries. So this is a historical examples and we'll talk later about how emerging technologies are taking us to the next step of that process. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Haim. I think it's, uh, it's a very, very great example and speaks to many of us here working in the aviation industry. We've seen some of that evolution happening in front of our eyes in the past 10 years, um, but you brought a little bit of history of what, what was the starting point for this cycle. So I appreciate the example, and I think I personally can uh, also draw some parallels from how low-cost airlines started to emerge 
within the traditional uh, network flight uh, airlines that we see in many parts of the world. So this is this is really interesting, and and maybe I would like to at this point um, shift gears and move into another important uh, value chain stakeholder, that's the airports. Now, airports in general uh, have enjoyed slightly better economic performance compared to the airlines uh, with regard to the return on invested capital. Uh, on the other hand, we have many airports that around the world that are not as efficient as expected, um, which is causing a little bit of a hinder to the growth of, and profitability of both the airports and the airlines community. Um, and with that in mind, I, I wanted to ask Professor Ray about his experience, um, about what, what are the new business models uh, that are being used for uh, development capital facilities? And airports will be part of that category. Uh, thank you, uh, Ismail. Uh, th there are really two big trends that I see picking up momentum um, with regard to delivery of many kinds of capital goods, not just um, buildings and infrastructure, but things like um, airplanes. For example, companies like Rolls-Royce are now selling jet engines by the hour as a service uh, to deliver them, operate them, maintain them, replace them with, uh, with subsequent ones and so on, instead of selling them as a product to an air, airplane manufacturer which then sells or leases them to an airline. Um, ditto, we see companies like Siemens um, going to hospitals and saying, instead of you having to worry about uh, maintaining your imaging technology, we will sell you MRI equipment and X-ray, CAT scan equipment uh, not as a product, although it's very nice for us to sell it to you as a product, but it might be a better business model for us to sell it to you as a long-term service. Again, we maintain it, we update it, uh, we, we, um, uh, we, we let your doctors and your radiologists operate it, but we provide the equipment as a long-term service rather than as a product. And we saw this begin to happen in capital facilities driven by two things, I think. One is the fact that, um, especially for public infrastructure like roads, bridges, airports, and so on, governments increasingly got indebted with um, overcommitments to pension funds and um, other kinds of problems and found themselves very short of financing capacity. Um, you know, infrastructure projects have to be paid for either by general tax revenues or by, by user fees, but even the ability to finance them became difficult for many governments, especially during the recent uh, downturn in the, in the global economy. And secondly, the fact that airports were now much more than uh, places for airplanes to disgorge passengers and freight and take on new passengers and freight. They became meeting places and shopping venues and all sorts of other things. With the hub and spoke airline model, many people spent significant amounts of time in airports and were interested in, in shopping and eating and, and sleeping and taking showers and getting massages and all kinds of things. And so many kinds of services were operating, operated in airports, not all of which government is particularly well equipped to, to manage, uh, deliver, and, and operate. And so we saw the rise of privately operated airports. And what we see now is uh, airports not only being operated privately, but being designed, built, financed, operated um, privately under long-term concessions from the governments which um, ha have to issue these concessions for them. This began at a very large uh, pace in the power industry in, in the 1970s and 80s where power production became privatized, so private firms opened up um, opened up airports, op opened up uh, power plants rather and, and sold them. Uh, and then secondly, we, we saw a takeoff in, in roads, bridges, um, and other facilities starting in the UK under the so-called PFI, uh, Privately Financed Infrastructure Initiatives. It spread to other Commonwealth countries, Australia, um, Canada being two examples that, that have used it extensively. Most of Australia's infrastructure has been built with investments by pension funds, not, not by governments. And we're seeing this now um, widely used in Latin America and Asia, beginning to take off in the, in the U.S. There are a few privately operated airports and the number is growing. And so I think that actually having an airport be provided or, or, or a jet engine for that matter be provided as a long-term service, if it's a complex technology that is subject to substantial change, uh, it makes a lot of sense for a private operator who becomes really expert in doing this to do it globally. 
Um, but it does raise a number of issues. It raises some public administration issues where some people feel that public goods should not be uh, operated for profit, especially not by foreign companies. And that we've seen this in, in a in very uh, substantial measure with the uh, water supply in places like Latin America, where in Bolivia, a revolution was fomented by private water companies selling power in, in uh, Cochabamba, which actually propelled Evo Morales into power. And so there are some public pushback to uh, to uh, public goods being operated for private profit. Uh, but uh, the other trend that I think is reinforcing this approach is that um, in a traditional delivery of something like an airport, uh, engineers have an incentive to over-design it to avoid liability. Contractors have an incentive to underbuild it to minimize their costs. And sometimes almost nobody has a, an incentive to maintain it very well. Uh, we see this uh, happening with roads and bridges falling down in many of the developed countries, and we see in developing countries inadequate infrastructure. Um, in, in the case of um, something like a capital facility, uh, creating a contract where somebody um, plans, designs, builds, operates, finances, and takes profit from something over a 30-year term and bids for that privilege to, to still maintain comp uh, a competitive procurement process uh, they now have a lifetime sustainability perspective that's very different from any of the players in a conventional capital delivery. So from my perspective, at least, I think this long-term service delivery of facilities like airports and, and jet engines and other complex things, MRI machines, actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, for the uh, drilling down a little deeper into the process, whether they are financed and operated conventionally by governments in the U.S., uh, we have this... Um, strange thing called a triple tax exempt bond, which is a giant cross subsidy of everybody else's infrastructure by everybody else giving up the revenues they would collect on taxes, but it makes public financing appear artificially cheap. And so um, at some level, it probably does promote investment in infrastructure. But because of that, it's been very difficult for private financing to compete with this subsidized uh, tax um, free government financing. Um, and so even if it's done publicly, we're seeing different ways of delivering it. And again, it's interesting, the UK was a leader in this. Um, in the offshore, o offshore oil industry, companies like BP and Mobile and Stott Oil and others, Shell, were finding that the amount of changes that they were incurring on these large offshore oil projects because of unknown technology operating at very deep ocean depths was so large that they were ending up with negotiated reimbursable cost contracts anyway. So what they have started to do is to create a set of alliance contracts where everybody gets all of their direct costs reimbursed, and they all share an incentive at the end of the project based on the client's overall satisfaction. And this model um, often involves things like all of the key participants on the project signing a single contract. In the UK, they call this an integrated form of agreement, IFOA. In the US, we're calling it IPD, or Integrated Project Delivery. Uh, this approach was very successfully used at Heathrow Terminal 5, uh, which was one of the first building projects to use this alliance contracting approach. Um, as a result of having this kind of contract, they were able to weather two very substantial um, environmental changes, one a regulatory change and one a technological change, that if they'd had a conventional form of engineering construction contract would have been extremely difficult to deal with and would have resulted in, in decades of legislation, uh, litigation rather. Um, the first is the Airbus 380, which suddenly required everything to be 15 to 20 feet higher and, um, and to have um, all the services in the airport be able to accommodate much larger surges of passengers disgorging from a single airplane. You know, six, 700 people instead of 400 people makes a big difference to customs, immigration, baggage handling, all kinds of things. And the second major um, lightning bolt that hit this airport and hit hit the whole world was the September 11, 2001 attack on the World Trade Center that suddenly required airports and airlines all over the world to drastically upgrade their security. This had a dramatic impact on airports. Uh, the, uh, the ability to accommodate those two changes in this IPD alliance contracting approach is now making this look more and more attractive to other airports, to hospitals, um, and to other organizations that build capital facilities whose requirements are likely to change over the five to 10 year period it often takes to plan and build them. So um, be happy if there are any more detailed questions to answer them in the Q&A session.
Thank, thanks a lot, Ray. And I think there was a question that you already answered about the role of the government and state in bringing innovation and cutting-edge technology to airports. So thank you for elaborating on that part. Um, the, uh, the, since we're talking about innovation, I think it's, it's important to realize that although we have very thin margins in the airline and airport uh, sectors, uh, those thin margins are coming mainly from the adoption of some technologies, as you both have referred to. I mean, Haim, you referred to the fact that um, the automation in issuing tickets and distribution channels have changed the way airlines are distributing their tickets through travel agents or directly. Um, that's, that's a major technological adoption. Uh, security was another thing that Ray was, was talking about. And I know that many airports now are adapting new technological uh, infrastructure to cope with these increased security measures. At the same time, uh, simplify the passenger travel. And, and the same thing, by the way, apply to the cargo area, which often is neglected. Uh, uh, new technologies are coming up to improve the way uh, paper airway belts, or as they call the documents that is attached to shipment, being handled today, and the future is going to be more electronic and more paperless. So a lot still to be done in the area of adapting new technologies, and I'm, I'm interested to know, and I'm sure the audience would be interested to know from you, Haim, in particular, about your uh, experiences in terms of emerging technologies that you have seen uh, reshaping the service industries in general. Thank you very much, Ishmael. Uh, and uh, if, when we think about the adoption of new technology, uh, it's useful to, to take a step back and think about the different stages in technology adoption. And usually when we look at major new technologies, which have a big impact on industries and the entire economy, their adoption follows four stages. The first stage is a stage that I call substitution, where the new technology substitutes for the old technology. And people uh, do essentially the same thing in a different way, very often a lower cost way, but they don't change their behavior, they don't change their business processes. They take the new technology and replace the old technology with more effective or more efficient technology. The second stage is a stage where we start taking advantage of the true capabilities of new technology by increasing scale. So what we do is, if the new technology is, for example, a technology with a lower cost, we don't, we still do roughly the same thing, but we do more of it because we can afford to do more of it because it, it costs less, it takes less time. So we, ended up, we end up increasing the scale of the use of the technology even though we do not qualitatively change the process. The third stage is the stage where we actually change the process, we change behavior, we start truly taking advantage of what the new technology can do. So uh, sometimes we can think about this as a change in scope of what we actually do with the new technology. And for some technologies, we reach the fourth stage, which I call transformation where the new technology truly transformed, transforms the way things are done in the industry and sometimes beyond the industry itself. And since we're talking about transportation, it's actually useful to think about the predecessor of aviation, where we've seen a lot of these stages in action and think about the uh, introduction of the car as a new technology when it was introduced. So when the cars were first introduced in the United States, uh, the first stage substitution was a stage where essentially the car was used in the same way people used the carriage. Nothing has, happened, has changed around the car. And of course, people called it the horseless carriage because you had an engine instead of a horse. But it was traveling in roughly the same way, could do a little more, could do it faster, could do it at lower cost, but there was no change in the process itself. The next stage was an increase in scale because we had the ability to travel longer distances a, at a shorter amount of time. People started traveling over longer distances 
uh, people travel more, people spend more time out, so people started experimenting and experiencing the effects of technology adoption that brings us to the third stage, which is scope, change in actual behavior. Because we could travel over longer distances, we didn't need to live where we worked. So people started moving to suburbs and having a different life at the suburb. A, you know, many aspects of what we see in America today were introduced during that period, like the drive-in movie, like fast food, all of which were based on people going out some more. If you think about, uh, the ch the, there was a big change in dating habits. Uh, before the car, uh, a date usually t took place by uh, the man coming to the woman's home under the guidance of her parents. And that had some impact on what you could or could not do in a date. And the car introduces many more uh, degrees of freedom and totally changed the, the nature of dating. Uh, many other behaviors have changed as well, which brings us to the fourth stage of structural change, transformation, a cultural shift where, uh, of course, transportation has changed the nature of retailing. It, it created uh, shopping malls. It enabled people uh, to live in different ways. Uh, it required, of course, new infrastructure. It totally changed the way people live, which kind of is the transformation arena. And of course, when we think about the effect of technology on aviation, I think that uh, in some dimensions, we are in the third stage. But on many of them, uh, we still have a, a, a transformation, I'm sorry, a transition from the second stage to the third stage, where we have more efficiency, but and the scope is changing in relatively minor ways. So uh, I specialize in information technology, so it's useful to think about today's technologies and the way they have an impact on travel. So of course, a, a leading technology today is the smartphone. And what makes it really important is that it gives you the ability to have a supercomputer in your pocket. A, importantly, a, in North America, most people today have a smartphone, so you can assume that the person, the other person actually has a smartphone, which you could not do three years ago. Uh, when you talk about travelers, even a higher percentage of them have smartphones. So in the United States, smartphone penetration is of the order of 55%. Smartphone penetration among travelers is approaching 80%. A second technology, which is having a big impact on, on, on the industry, along with all industries, is cloud computing, which really means that everything is connected. It means that whatever cannot be done on the supercomputer in your pocket can be done even more efficiently on a supercomputer in the cloud. Uh, together, these two uh, technologies enable a more dynamic, real-time economy. There's an increasing role for marketplaces, uh, uh, decisions made in, in real time. Uh, when you think about booking travel, it's interesting that uh, when people book travel from a smartphone, they tend to do it the same day, whereas traditionally we used to book travel months in advance. The percentage of cases where this is happening is decreasing. Uh, we have in a third technology that is having an impact on travel is new devices, new sensors with us. A Google Glass a, a bringing the smartphone to, uh, to uh, other senses. A, another technology which is worth mentioning is big data, which enables both businesses and consumers not only to have a lot of information, but to also act on it, to be able to predict where we're going, uh, to be able to have a vision of the future, which is actionable. And finally, uh, social connections are an important element of new technology, special, especially when you talk about travel. Uh, it's well known, for example, that in leisure travel, uh, the social dimension is important. We're talking about a highly social product. As a matter of indication of that, uh, Expedia used to have a service that's called Travel TripAdvisor, where uh, Expedia had 
the technology, the relationships with the suppliers, the relationships with the consumers in all TripAdvisor was, was simply a recommendation service. So you could recommend a, recommend the hotel, you could recommend the location. And a, so basically the assets of TripAdvisor were the recommendations and the social connections. When Expedia spent off TripAdvisor, very quickly the market value of TripAdvisor exceeded the market value of Expedia. I looked it up this morning. So this morning, the market value of TripAdvisor was greater than $14 billion. The market value of Expedia was less than $10 billion. So actually, the social connections are worth then more than the actual, uh, the, the entire set of computers and relationships in everything that Expedia does, which is one indication of where uh, we're going. Uh, let me uh, talk briefly about some of the results of these trends. Uh, as in other, other industries, what we observe is a shift uh, to a traveler-centric, real-time set of solutions. So in part because of our experience as consumer, in part as, as a result of our experience in other industries, what is happening is that we expect travel to be uh, centered around us uh, with minimal constraints, uh, both when we talk about leisure travel and when we talk about business travel. Small example, leisure travel leisure. discovery, we're moving from a process where you say, I want to go to place X on date Y, to a process where a, increasingly what we're going to get is more solutions that tell us what we might want to do when we don't know where we want to go, and it will be able, and there are technologies that are being developed as we speak that enable us to, to, to actually discover what we want to do and do it at an increasing level of efficacy based on our profile, our past transactions, activities, locations we visited in the past, locations there where we are right now, in a business trip, we combine that with our calendar, our customers' calendars, information about the value of a customer, information about our relationships with customers, information about past trips, transactions, orders, complaints can be very important in that process. We can combine that with social data, what your friends liked may be a good predictor of what you would like. We can create group travel in a more seamless way. We can use correlations with other activities that may or may not be obvious to us. So for example, let me give you some correlations which are actually true. So people who used eBay prefer to fly on Virgin America, Southwest, and JetBlue. Those who don't use eBay prefer to fly United and American Airlines. So we can actually infer people's preferences from the way they, the other online behaviors that they exhibit. A people who ever dated someone of a different race are more interested in international travel. People who pack light prefer an aisle seat. A others prefer a window seat. So a lot of these predictions are predictions we can make on all of these bits and pieces of information, and we can do it in real time. On top of that, we can automate people's identities using technologies that are available to us today. We can use sensors to monitor people's uh, body, for example, to see whether they're under stress. If they're under stress, we can uh, offer to them uh, less stressful uh, travel solutions so that we match not only their business needs and their express needs, but their actual state of mind. And of course, we can use augmented reality like using your Google Glass to kind of uh, tell you about the history of a place you're looking at. And it all happens in real time and without you having to prompt anybody uh, to do anything for you. This imposes a major set of requirements on the industry because those uh, customer-centric solutions require much higher levels of coordination and communication among participants in the industry. It creates new technology demands on the connections between suppliers. And of course, it creates new dimensions of competitions and new types of intermediaries that are information intermediaries that will increasingly 
uh, play a role in this new environment. Thank you, Haim. And I think there are many questions that are starting to come uh, to the screen, which I, I also just remind everybody that we're going to address them at the end of this uh, webinar. But thank you for, for uh, shedding some light on how technology can reshape the service industries in general, but also our air transport industry. Um, now, I mean, a challenge for our industry is really about getting those ideas, innovation, new strategies into actions in a fairly quick uh, period of time. Um, and, and that challenge continues to happen every time we, we are faced with um, a problem or a potential opportunity for our different aviation value chain. And a question to uh, Professor Ray from his experience with uh, project management uh, and implementation. What are the, the, the best practices or the methods that you would recommend, but also you've seen working for other industries that can help our industry to move from this strategy planning phase or innovation ideation phase into execution? Thank you for that question. Uh, Professor Mendelson has talked about... Uh, thanks for the question, Ishmael. Professor Mendelssohn has talked about the, um, the new business models and the new technologies that require companies to develop and implement um, substantial changes. Um, the history of coming up with strategic ideas and being successfully able to implement them is littered with the dead bodies of companies that fail to do that in time or fail to do it at all. Uh, I can think of the telecoms industry. I can think of, you know, Transworld Airlines. I can think of um, Pan American Airlines. I can think of a number of companies that were not able to adapt their strategies quickly enough as the world changed. And so what we have seen happen in the last two decades, perhaps a little less than two decades, about 15 or so years, is that senior executives are coming to appreciate something that they historically thought was, uh, was the province of people that, that worked several levels below them. And that is the idea of, of using projects as a language to define and execute work that needs to be done in order to accomplish some higher level objective like a strategic change. And as recently as about 10 years ago, I had a journal paper that was being reviewed by the Harvard Business Review. And the, uh, the first editor was quite excited about it, but uh, uh, that, that editor left HBR and a new editor came in took one look at our paper and said, well, we publish for executives. We don't do project management. And so that, that attitude has really changed because people have become aware that if you take a strategic initiative and break it down into a series of relatively well-defined projects and programs, and you use many of the techniques that were developed in the aerospace construction and uh, pharmaceutical industries for getting big projects done, you can actually get a strategy implemented as a series of projects, each one of which has someone accountable for doing it, has clear deliverables, and has a series of um, milestones and tasks that need to be done and can be tracked and can be um, provided additional resources as needed. And so um, connecting the projects that compose the elements of a strategic plan to a company's high-level vision was um, recognized as, as an important thing to do. And over the last 15 years in the Stanford Advanced Project Management Program, we have developed a strategic execution framework that links the overall development of strategy uh, with ongoing operations. And in particular, when strategy requires changes in those operations, it has to flow all the way down from the senior levels that create the new strategy through the mid-managers to the people actually doing the work. And what we have found is that a framework consisting of six parts, which I'll go through briefly, allows the um, organization to make its strategy clear to the people that need to implement it, allows the people who are implementing it to be able to make real-time changes to the, to the uh, projects that they're working on in a way that achieves the high-level outcomes rather than just the outputs of the particular project as they were initially defined when the strategy is changing, and that that makes sure that the results of projects get um, transitioned into operations so that the organization actually gets the benefit of the uh, strategy being executed. So we start, and by the way, many of these ideas have been written about by management uh, writers for, for years and years, but 
we think that the framework was put together for the first time in this strategic execution framework. The first set of ideas is a set of ideas about organizations having a very clear ideation, who they are, why they exist, where they're going. And, and you know, books and, and volumes of books have been written about um, companies having a clear way of expressing what it is they're trying to get done, having a vision that inspires people and that directs all of their activities and helps them make all the real-time adjustments in, in what they do in a way that results in that high-level vision being accomplished. You can think of books like Good, Good to Great, um, Built to Last, and so on that, that go back uh, decades uh, that, that stress the importance of this. Um, in order to execute a strategy, especially if a company is changing from a product model to a service model, there needs to be a significant change in the culture, which is extremely difficult for companies to implement. Uh, we've watched with um, amazement how IBM transformed itself from primarily a product company to a primarily a service company under the leadership of Louis Gerstner. What he had to do was go in and take an organization which valued technical excellence in producing giant machines that lived in glass temples managed by priests in white coats that were not accessible to normal human beings to IBM becoming a company that delivers global IT services for international companies that are in consumer products or banking or other industries uh, anywhere in the world um, and using anybody's hardware, not just IBM's. And so an IBM service industry that would sell somebody a Sun server or, or Horace, an Apple uh, product, uh, what was a major cultural change for that organization to accomplish? So the second part of the strategic execution framework we call nature. So starting with the ideation, you have to adjust your, your strategy, or, or as you try to implement a new strategy, you have to change the structure, which is relatively easy to do. Gerstner could do that in about a year. And then the culture, which can take five to 10 years to change in a big company with 100,000 employees or more. The third part of this is having a really clear vision. We'll probably come back to Southwest Airlines in, in some of the questions, but Southwest Airlines articulated a really clear vision about being a low-cost carrier that would have no frills, no seat reservations, no meals, no interline baggage transfers, very quick airplane turnarounds, and articulated it in a clear enough way that they were able to implement it very, very effectively and provide substantial challenges to the existing airlines that were stuck with high-cost um, cultures and high-cost business models. And so clearly articulating the vision in terms of a set of goals and metrics that, that everyone can understand allows the, the fourth part of the, um, the framework to emerge, and that is portfolio management. So it's all very well to take a strategy, break it up into projects, and allocate resources to that project. But two things happen. The world keeps changing, so the strategy needs to adapt. And then projects don't always work out the way they're planned, as we know very well. As Robbie Burns, the Scottish writer, said, the best laid plans are mice and men gang after glee. Um, bad things happen and projects go worse than expected. Occasionally they go better than expected. Either way, resources need to be reallocated in real time. And most companies were stuck with a traditional once a year capital budgeting process that was not nearly nimble enough. So moving to real time portfolio management. And then the last two stages, I'll, I'll say very briefly to leave a little bit of time for questions. Synthesis and transition. Synthesis is executing projects using the appropriate um, approach to project management, traditional versus much more agile or decentralized. And then finally, the results of projects have to be transitioned into operations so that the, uh, the organization can, can reap the benefits. So going through ideation, nature, vision, engagement, synthesis, and transition allows companies to execute strategies reliably. So let me ask Ishmael, if you wouldn't mind, telling us a little bit more about the week in, in Montreal. Yeah, th thank you, Ryan. I think this webinar uh, we have today is a great example of how our program would look like. I mean, we, uh, or the whole objective of this partnership with Stanford is to develop a kind of a, a T-shape competency. We, in IATA, in the week in Montreal, we're going to look at the uh, vertical competency that is related to the aviation industry. So our focus will be really around four uh, key areas, uh, starting with civil aviation authorities. So we're going to look at the um, the evolution of civil aviation authorities, the air navigation service provisions, and see how uh, the government can play more proactive role in regulating this this industry in the new century. 
So that's really uh, first focus. And the second would be really about what we touch touch upon in this in this uh, webinar about business models, but in particular to airlines understanding a little bit about what it takes to lead an airline to success. Uh, and we're going to use some simulation here in, in Montreal to try to uh, go beyond the theoretical discussion and try to simulate real cases uh, of potential future uh, new business models for, for airlines. The third focus is really going to be about the second uh, and, and very important player in the aviation value chain, that, that's airports. And we talked to a little bit more about it in this uh, webinar. Uh, airports are changing, and they are becoming more than just uh, an area where airlines are landing and departing. Of course, that's an important part that keeps airports today surviving in, 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 in activity, but there are other trends that is happening with what airports are supposed to be doing. Uh, so that, that focus would really try to bring the latest thinking in the airport area. And, and then the, the, the last uh, area of focus in the week of Montreal, we really look at the uh, aviation mega projects. We're going to try to summarize to you or to the participants who will come to the, to the class in Montreal all the key projects that we see from IADA at the global level that is coming uh, in the different aviation value chain areas, including airports and infrastructure, but also technology, processes, uh, partnership, alliances all of the different mega projects that, that is being uh, developed as we speak. And uh, that will lead you to the Stanford week, which I will let uh, uh, Professor Ray to explain. So very briefly, uh, it's going to be more of the kinds of discussion we had today. We're going to talk, first of all, about how to think about strategy really long term with, a, with a, um, an approach called foresight thinking, which builds on ideas from our design school. Um, we will then get into business models, strategy, uh, pricing kind of ideas, uh, and, and other, uh, um, other aspects of, of developing good strategies. And then at the end of the program, we'll talk in more detail about the last question I answered today about how you actually execute an innovative strategy in a big business. You know, how do you keep, keep the train running while you're renovating the train in real time? Uh, without destroying your existing business, a lot related to Professor Mendelssohn's first comments about um, innovating and at the same time cannibalizing your existing business. We probably have time. I mean, again, we're probably over time at this point, so I'm going to ask if we can maybe just answer one or two or three questions. That would be great. Uh, Ishmael, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, th thank you, Ryan. Um, a question really came as a follow-up to, uh, to your uh, comment, uh, Professor Ray, on how the A380 uh, has somehow changed the way airports or modern airports operate. There's a question from the audience that, uh, that, that states that actually the design of the A380 was built around not changing the airport operations or infrastructure. So how, how do you see uh, your comment applicable to what at least the intention of the design was? Well, I think it was addressing a desire, you know, to, to address the problem of crowded skies by having fewer airplanes up there. My friends who worked on the Terminal 5 airport tell me there were substantial changes they had to introduce. It didn't radically change the way the airports operated, but it would have been a very different passenger experience to have 800 people converge on a certain size baggage claim or a certain size immigration platform um, than it is to have three or 400 people come off an airplane. And so the larger size and the arrival of large numbers of people simultaneously uh, would have been feasible to accommodate at airports, and the extra height would have been feasible for the ramps at some airports, but not other airports without structural changes. But just the fact that the planes were so bigger and delivered such bigger chunks of passengers at times, uh, perhaps not strictly required, but, but, uh, but certainly induced airlines to upgrade the, the, the capacity of many of the services that passengers getting on and off airplanes would, would require. Thank you. And there was a question that uh, was really a follow-up on the role of uh, technology to change or reshape our, our industry. Uh, there was a question from the audience on the role of the government and how can the government facilitate the adoption of new technologies. Uh, there, there is a comment that sometimes the government can be perceived or, uh, in reality, block those innovation or adoption of, of, of new technologies, such as paperless environments that we've, we've been talking about. So how do you see the role of government in, in you know, modernizing the industry? 
You know, the role of government in the United States has on the one hand helped innovation and on the other hand has hindered it. Through, through the financing of basic research being done primarily in the U.S. in universities, but some of it in government laboratories, the U.S. seeded the internet uh, with, with early research done by ARPA. They seeded all kinds of innovations, uh, materials innovations, you know, the, the fiber composites that are being built to use the Boeing Dreamliners were, were developed initially, actually some of the technology right in this building I'm sitting in at Stanford in our Aero Astro department by George Springer and his colleagues. But at the same time, the government regulates industries like airlines and makes it very, very difficult to, to approve new technologies that pose risk of public harm. The government always sees itself as providing building codes and safety codes to protect the public at the same time they create these innovations. And I'm afraid in, in a number of countries we have succumbed to, um, to a particular kind of pernicious um, lawsuit that not only um, disincentivizes us through regulations, but disincentivizes companies with a fear of liability. I'm right down into our university becoming much more conservative about the kind of things it does. And so, again, government should continue to, to finance basic technology and many kinds of regulatory processes, patent law, you know, the regulation of drugs, where, where drugs with, that could potentially save lives take too long to come to market because of very rigorous testing requirements that don't really balance risk with benefits, but just try to eliminate risks. I'm afraid we've become a do-no-harm society where government has become so averse to, to risk, partly spurred by lawyers. And by the way, our United States Congress is almost 100% made up of lawyers um, who are just by nature risk averse, that, that they are definitely slowing down technologies. And so this would extend to, you know, the kind of passenger screening that's happening. You could argue that the biggest economic impact of 9-11 of, of um, is just the waste of time and, and, and the huge amount of effort that's gone into screening passengers at airports. And I'm not saying it isn't necessary. There are people in the world who would like to do harm to passengers on airplanes and use airplanes as projectiles against buildings. Uh, but, you know, the, the cost of regulation has been enormous. And so I'm not sure if that addresses the user's question. Yeah. Thank you for that. I mean, I'll, I'll take a last question maybe that was addressed to me on how do we project uh, the innovation adoption within airlines in 2050, especially with uh, the oil price increases uh, that is out of our industry control. And I think, you know, it's very hard for us to predict what the innovation would look like in our industry by the year 2050 or by a specific year. Uh, but w it's important to note that those type of pressures that came from outside the industry, the external factors, as we call them, including uh, uh, oil prices and the increases there, have actually forced, in a way, our industry, and in particular the airlines, to think a little bit creatively and differently. Um, you know, uh, the, the airlines have been the main reason to go and speak to manufacturers to adapt new uh, and innovative technologies in producing aircrafts that are uh, more efficient in terms of uh, consumption of, of, uh, of, of, of oil, but also uh, have bigger capacity, as being mentioned by Professor Ray. So I think th the trend will be more uh, responsive to those pressures, external pressures, uh, that will make us more innovative just to maintain and sustain our uh, performance as an industry. And uh, I, I know there has been a lot of questions, but I promise here uh, that we will try as much as possible to summarize them and come back to uh, the, the people who ask the question uh, electronically or by, by other means. So, uh, Ray, uh, uh, to you. Ismail, I'd like to ask you a question as someone who understands the airline industry much better than us. Um, a few miles away from us at Google, people are developing driverless cars. You know, cars operate only in a single plane. They only have the ability to avoid obstacles in two dimensions. Airplanes can avoid obstacles in three dimensions. And it's not too big a stretch of the imagination to imagine that by 2050 we might have driverless single passenger airplanes. What would that do to the air airline industry? Or is that too big a question for today? <laughs> oh, I, think, I think it's something that may, may come soon. And as a matter of fact, if we look at the uh, air defense industry, uh, there has been already a lot of... Uh, you know, advancement with regard to innovating uh, those type of technologies. So I think it's it's something that uh, that may come. Uh, when that's a big question indeed, and it requires more technical analysis. So uh, it's a valid question. 